it, it was started in 1867. Do the math. What does that mean? That means 50 some years it's got a white president. Howard University, how come? <laughs> Probably because they can't. Yes, yes, yes. Money flows from the Congress. The Congress is virtually all white. It doesn't get its first black member until 1926 with Oscar DePriest from Chicago. Oscar DePriest lives right down the street in LaJoy Park. Oscar DePriest is the first African American member of Congress in 1926. Since Reconstruction, 1877. Reconstruction ended in 1877. And Jim Crow, let's go back to your timeline, right? Violent Jim Crow oppression, white supremacy lasts from the end of the Civil War to 1965. The students rebel at Howard University in the, in the, in the, in the uh, spring of 26, demanding a black president and demanding black teachers. Who would have known, right? It's true. They demanded a black president and black teachers. They were virtually all white. That's a black college. It's an HBCU. But it's run by white people. And most of the money is from white Congress. And white people pull the purse, purse strings, I mean control the purse strings, therefore pulled the strings that control the curriculum. This is happening at, go ahead, Melissa. Okay, it's the same back last year, they wouldn't go to classes. I think they sat, they sat in one room all together and like none of them went to class. Yeah, all of that is, is part of all of that, correct. It's the same time that Carter G. Woodson right down the street, just a few blocks away, is creating a Black History Week, which is not exactly accurate, but I'll talk about that in a second. And where he's writing in 1926, he's creating the Negro History Journal in 1926. And he's writing the definitive piece of literature, Connor G. Woodson called, the definitive piece of literature on black education called, you all read it, you ain't read it, you need to read it, The Miseducation of the Negro. Okay? Yeah, you know that. I mean, The Miseducation of the Negro, he's saying, oh, we're being miseducated, what we're getting is all white interpretation of American history not our interpretation of American history. And our interpretation, he's saying, is not incorrect, or it's not, it's not slanted pro-black, it's not slanted anti-white, it's pro-black to try and get some balance in American history interpretation. So this is all happening in the same period of time, and this period of time is called the New Negro Movement, 1920s. It's all happening right here and the students say, hey, we're part of that. We want, a black we want a black president, and we want black professors, and we want black curriculum. All at the same time, it's happening. Behind me, what do you see? Nine and a half street. Nine and a half street. That's important. That's important. Very good, Sesson. You're so good. I observed that. What else is that? What is Nine and a Half Street? What is it anyway? It used to be, isn't it where it used to be a lot of poor black people used to live there? Yeah. And they had a high crime rate. And what is it actually? You're right. All of this, these are all correct answers. It's an alley. It's an alley. That's what I word I'm looking it's for. A nice it's an alley. It's a nice alley. Yeah. I've never seen a nice one like that. <laughs> 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 in the 1850s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, African Americans are fleeing the oppressive Jim Crow South and they're coming north. And they're coming across the, the Potomac River. And they're looking for safe haven. And they come up 7th Street because the wharf at the end of 7th Street is the embarkation place of Washington, D.C. It's where you come into Washington, D.C. by water by crossing the Potomac River from racist, violent South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia. And you come here and you're looking for a safer, better life, and you don't have any money, and you probably don't have an education, and you may not be able to read and write, but you might have family or a friend living somewhere in an alley, literally an alley. 
So my little street, you all been in my house, you've been in my house a couple of times, my little street used to be an alley, Front Street. We have R Street here, S Street here, and an alley between the two. Today it's called Front Street. But it used to be an alley and that's where poor people, Jews, Jewish people who are poor, Irish who are poor, Italians who are poor, black people who are poor, come and try to find a place to live and they find a place in an alley. Alley becomes this major socioeconomic uh, dynamic that occurs in Washington, D.C. And you see them all over the place in Washington. You see them in Foggy Bottom, Queens Court, Mews, Mews, uh, Hughes Mews, all that behind over 25th Street. You see the behind those little houses? Those are alleys. That was alley life of Foggy Bottom, alley life of Shaw, alley life of Capitol Hill, a major socioeconomic reality that was very important to for survival. Out of the alleys come what? Out of the alleys come entrepreneurship. Out of the alleys come churches. Out of the alleys come little schools. Out of the alleys come little businesses. And people get their footing into American culture and American society from the alley. And this is not a black thing. This is an American thing. Jews in New York City all gathered into alleys. The Irish in New York City in the 1850s and 40s lived in alleys. The Jews in the 1890s and 1920s lived in alleys. The Poles, I'm Polish, we lived in alleys in Baltimore just to get into America and survive. And African Americans were the alley life of Washington, D.C. But at the time of Howard Theater, alleys all around here were really important because that's where people would hang out. That's where the pubs were. That's where the brothels were. That's where the bars and everything were. And people were going up and down alleys all around 7th Street. And in fact, was the next part of my lecture. Exactly there. Come down here and I'll pick up on that point.